Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, SJP Properties, Allied Partners, Greenberg Traurig LP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust, Antares Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, CB Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Herrick Feinstein, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, John Katsimatidis, Herbert J. Sims Company, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Sidney Fetner Associates, Sheldrake Organization, Signature Bank, Studley, the Moynian Organization, Triangle Services, the Wickoff Organization, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction. Health care is king in New York, and there are people who are responsible for the development of health care and running these institutions. Today I have Dr. Kenneth Davis, the president and CEO of the Mount Sinai Medical Center and um, School of Medicine. Thank you for being here today. Pleasure to be with you. So, you know, it's always good to have people, Brooklyn boys, people who were born in Brooklyn. So you were born in Brooklyn, and you grew up until you were like five years of age, uh, a couple blocks from uh, Kings County, right? From Kings County Hospital. And then what happened? You moved out to Syosset? Moved to Syosset um, in 1954. Now, in Syosset, you know, it, you know, we were talking when we got together, some people know what they want to do, and you said to me that probably as a youth, you really wanted to get involved because you, something with, uh, with Einstein and the brain, what was, what was that? Well, um, you know, growing up in the 50s, it was an interesting time for science, uh, and I believed that the most incredible thing anybody could ever do is be a scientist. But, you know, the, who was the preeminent scientist in the 50s? It was Albert Einstein. And who had the presumption to say they wanted to be a scientist? I mean, even at a young age, I knew I couldn't say I want to be a scientist. So. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but in my heart, I thought it would be really terrific if I could be a scientist. Now, now in high school, you told me some interesting things because you know certain things. You know, and I, I, as I said to you, I don't mind things. There's a term, you know, beshet in Yiddish, if it's meant to be. Now, in, in high school, um, as opposed to playing baseball, you were a track and field, right? You were right. a runner, right? And, and what happened? Something happened during high school because being a track and field helped you get into Yale, right? right. There, there are a lot of strange events. Um, like every kid who probably grew up at that time, um, I want to be a baseball player. And uh, I remember going out for my baseball team. In those days, the first time you go out for your baseball team was in eighth grade. I went out for my baseball team and it was clear as the cuts began to happen that for reasons I couldn't explain, this coach just didn't want to cut me. So it was the last day and he was just throwing me meatballs and hoping that I would hit something so that he could find a way to put me on this team. And I probably didn't come close to anything. So he took me aside, he put his hand around me and he said, look, I know you're real fast. Why don't you go out for track? And I did. Uh, and I was very fast and I was very good. Um, and as a consequence, it led to um, my going to Yale, uh, which I clearly would have never done had I not been a runner. Now at Yale, uh, how did you decide to uh, 
you know, you knew you were going pre-med at Yale, and I think perhaps, as you said to me, in your junior year, you worked at Nassau County Medical Center in the psychiatry department, and you saw how dysfunctional the Department of Psychiatry and the treatment of psychiatry was? Well, um, I, like a lot of people who are interested in behavior uh, in college, perhaps even before then, in fact, at a very young age, I remember reading the biography, Jones's biography of Freud. And I was fascinated with Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, and if I could have pictured myself doing anything, it was that I would be a psychiatrist and somehow it would tie into doing research. Um, but when I worked in the Nassau County Medical Center, my job was statistics, to analyze what was going on in all the clinics that the Nassau County Medical Center ran. And it was apparent from the analyses that I was giving to people that uh, nobody was really getting a whole lot better. Um, and it was very frustrating to see. And I met a lot of the directors of those clinics. And in those days, it was still a time that the psychoanalytic movement dominated psychiatry. And even though these clinics were taking care of chronically ill schizophrenic patients or people with bipolar disease or serious depression, they were still being run by the analytic movement. And it was clear that not a whole lot of people were getting better. And it was, to me, very frustrating. Uh, and it was to also to the people who managed the, the system. That was also at the same time that papers began to be published around the efficacy of psychopharmacology, which caused me to question what was some of the fundamental beliefs about what really were the basis of serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disease, if they could be so treated as well as they were in the literature with pharmacology. And it was so apparent to me that when it was being applied, at least in these clinics, verbal therapies weren't doing a whole lot. So you finish that. How do you end up at, the, at this new college of, uh, of medicine? Because you were, the, you were in the second class at, at Sinai, which at that time was part of the city university. And, and what, what was the circumstance? Um, you know, as we all recall, the, the uh, end of the 60s, I graduated from college in 69. It was a time of lots of political turmoil and lots of ideas were being tested. Um, and I interviewed at the places that one would expect you know, I would have interviewed after medical school. And um, they were, you know, interviews where nobody was falling over backwards saying to me, gee, you've got to come to our medical school. Despite what I might have thought they should have been saying, nobody really was. Uh, and um, for some reason, I was probably taught into it, by, talked into it by members of my family who had been associated with Mount Sinai. They said, you know, there's this new medical school. You ought to apply to Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I went for my interview, and uh, I th thought this was going to be an amazing place. There were only 40 students in the class, um, second year. And I met somebody from Yale who was from my residential college who had gone there, and he said, oh, this is just a wonderful place. And at the end of the day, I was asked to see the director of admissions who said, how would you like to come here? And I said, right now? You're asking me right now? And he said, yeah, we're asking you if you would accept admission to Mount Sinai right now. I said, I think that'd be a great idea. So just like that, I made the decision, and I ultimately um, went to Mount Sinai. Uh, when I look back on it, it was a rather um, precipitous decision. Um, but it all turned out very well. Even though it was a very new school, and there were lots of growing pains at the beginning, clearly for me, it turned out to be a very good decision. So now here's a guy born in Brooklyn, raised in Syosset, undergraduate in New Haven, uh, medical school in Upper, uh, let's say, uh, Harlem, basically, you know, Fifth Avenue, right. but truly Harlem. And then you go to Stanford. How did you decide to go to Stanford, which is a top-notch place? Well, um, the chairman of psychiatry at Mount Sinai said to me, for what you want to do, which was research psychiatry, the best department in the country at that time was Stanford, that it was the leading place in academic research-oriented psychiatry, said they were applying neurobiology to psychiatric disease. And he said, there's a guy you've got to work with, the chairman of the department, his name is David Hamburg. So you really have got to go to Stanford. And I thought going to California would be great, because after all, when I was growing up, I was a New York Giant baseball fan until the Giants moved out. And this was a chance to root for the San Francisco Giants, so how bad could it be? So I went to Stanford. Now, you spent six years in Stanford, three years as a resident and three years as a researcher. 
doing research and um, learning really uh, how to be a, an academician, a clinical scientist, because it's really an apprenticeship, mentorship situation, and I had a very good group of mentors there, and um, they taught me a lot about the scientific method and how to do, how to write grants and be successful. Then leaving Stanford, the Giants, and all this, you, you, you return, but not to Sinai, partially to Sinai, you return to the Bronx. Right. You go to the Bronx VA. Bronx VA. Uh, it was, as other people thought from the outside, I must have had a mini psychotic episode. I left this idyllic setting. We had built a home just in the Palo Alto Hills, Los Altos Hills behind Stanford. It's a beautiful place. I had one year old daughter, a son, my wife, was, we were happy there. And um, we walked, we went to the Bronx, which at that time um, was, was just... The Bronx was burning. Yeah, and it was just the time that the movie Born on the Fourth of July was playing, and you know, it was all about how bad the Veterans Administration hospitals were, and here I am going to the Bronx. And not only did I go to the Bronx, but a whole bunch of people from Stanford came with me. You brought about ten people, you said. Ten people. But you also, at that time, uh, reunited yourself with Mount Sinai. Yeah. Part of the reason I went was I knew it was Mount Sinai. I knew that there was a chance to really initiate what was then called biological psychiatry at a place that was very receptive to it coming. Um, and the Bronx VA was actually a special VA. It was a place that had more of the highest award ever given to researchers in the VA system, something called the Middleton Award. It had five Middleton Award winners, and it had just received a Nobel Prize for Ros Yalo for radio immunoassay. So it was a very academically committed Veterans Administration. It had a great leader and a fellow named Julie Wolf. He was terrific. The dean of the school at Sinai at that time, Tom Chalmers, really wanted to make this happen and was going to invest money in our program at the Bronx VA. So we had resources and most importantly we had authority. We were in charge of the whole service and we could turn it into an academic service, really improve the quality and do things that we um, we're beginning to do at Stanford, but we could do much right, more effectively. You said to me when we got together, there were certain major developments, you know, with, with Alzheimer's disease and other programs that came out of those days at yeah. uh, the VA. Tell me about that. Well, um, <clears throat> this is a time that neurochemicals in the brain were being associated with various diseases and various behaviors. Uh, I got interested in one called acetylcholine. Uh, others were interested in things like norepinephrine and serotonin, but I was studying acetylcholine. And I was using various drugs that could increase acetylcholine in the brain. And one of the studies that I did actually showed that I could make people learn more words, remember better, improve their cognition. These were normal young Stanford students by giving them a drug that would increase brain acetylcholine. And at the time that was um, being written, as I was writing that paper, others were discovering that acetylcholine was deficient in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. So the last paragraph of the article that I wrote, I said that this work had obvious implications for Alzheimer's disease, and in fact it did. Um, it led to a series of studies that led to what we call proof of concept studies in which I gave these same kind of drugs to patients with Alzheimer's disease and showed that they could have some improvement in their memory, which led to the approval of the whole class, ultimately, of compounds called the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are pretty much, even today, the standard treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of my friend scientists did, at that time, some very important work in Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia at the Bronx VA, and that ultimately spread to Mount Sinai. Then I think it's, what, 1987, you become the, uh, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry? At Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai. Continuing at the VA. Continuing at the VA, the VA was a very important program, and what our goal was, was to extend what we did to the VA to Mount Sinai Hospital. And we were successful in doing that. We, we grew programs in genetics, in autism, in depression, in schizophrenia, in post-traumatic stress disorder, and it has become and remains today a leading department of academic psychiatry. So how, how does the, the, the scientist, the researcher, really become the CEO of a medical center? Accidentally. <laughs> totally accidental, um, what, because what? it relates to the building of, of what right. happens. Right. Because you, when, <clears throat> when you were there, a number of the buildings were built, the, the hospital was rebuilt in 92, 93, 
<clears throat> and you were the chairman, and you were going back and forth. But in the 90s, it was the go-go days of uh, 90s, the early 2000s, go-go days of mergers. Everybody was going to merge. Everybody was creating right. the HMOs and all this other uh, troubles. And you, all of a sudden... Well, we, not related to anything that I did, no, I had, uh, I did mo uh, merged, had that merger of the hospitals of Mount Sinai Hospital and Tisch Hospital into the Mount Sinai NYU Health System. And um, for Mount Sinai, that was not a very successful merger. Uh, but after that merger, and as it was beginning to evolve, um, Jack Rowe, who was the CEO, uh, stepped down to go to Aetna. And then about a year later, Arthur Rubenstein, who was the dean of the medical school, stepped down to go to Penn. And uh, Nate Case, who had been the dean, stepped in to be the interim dean and CEO. Um, our board and his nominated committee met, and they had to pick a new CEO and a new dean. Um, I thought that I would perhaps be a good dean, so I made myself a candidate to be the dean. I'd been the chairman of psychiatry for 15 years, and I was chosen. So I began being the dean in January, middle of January, 03. Uh, about eight months earlier, the board had chosen uh, Ken Burns to be the president and CEO of the medical center. But about 10 weeks after I took the job as dean, the board asked Ken Burns to leave. And they asked me to become both the CEO and the dean. But You know, I, I know you like to get into difficult times, but you got into, you become the, the, the president, CEO, and dean in a time when the institution was losing about a quarter of a billion dollars a year? Between the last quarter of 02 and the first quarter of 03, adding our losses in the medical school plus the hospital and extrapolating those two quarters for a year, we had a run rate loss of a quarter of a billion dollars at that period. Now the the interesting thing is, and, and certain people, you know, certain people think that you know it's the cut expenses that you'll make the hospital and the medical center efficiently, but you had a different approach, which was to look at your revenues right. and try to right. generate right. revenues and also rebuild the hospital both physically and departmentally yes. and staff-wise. So what happens? Well, I had watched the process of Mount Sinai and its problems close up for about two years. Um, initially as a part of these turnaround committees as a faculty member, and um, I'd seen a series of consultants come into Mount Sinai. And the mantra of all the consultants was FTE reduction, was expense reduction. Um, and whenever the question was raised, about growing revenue, the answer that you would hear is, we don't believe in the revenue ferry. Um, so there was no program development. There was some efforts at being doing better at getting paid for what we were doing, but they weren't great. Now in the 10 weeks that I was the dean and very close to the CEO then, watching what they were doing, we were making FTE cuts like crazy. Um, and what I was watching was service deteriorate. And I began to get the feeling that the margin that makes, that affects the decisions people make about using a hospital, the things that made people come to a hospital were being lost. The differential, of the discriminators among hospitals were being lost to our decrement. Um, if you are satisfied with the place being a little less clean, if nurses respond a little less rapidly, all those things lead to patients saying, this isn't a very good place. So after I was offered the position, I thought about it a long time. I spoke then to Peter May, who's the chairman of the board, and some other board members. And um, I said that I wanted to grow programs, that I thought the only way that we could really turn this around was to invest what money we had um, to improve the place, to bring in doctors, to grow programs, and um, to take the risks that up to that point we weren't taking. And the board agreed. Um, we set aside all the unrestricted money in the endowment and committed it. Um, but in right. fact, we needed very little of it. Right, you also uh, at that time uh, 
put on the block of sale, 1200 Fifth Avenue. We sold one building, um, which gave us some breathing room. But you know, when you're losing at a quarter of a billion dollars a year, a $42 million a dollar b building isn't going to last for very long unless you start to do things very differently. Uh, and my job, as I saw it, was to recruit an entirely new management team and then to take it on myself to start to recruit more doctors to Mount Sinai who could build great programs or had great programs already. But you know, re relating to this, and this is important, I think we discussed this once when you were on the other show, you, you know, all the hospitals, it's, I don't want to use the same mantra of the condominiums, but you know, you see Mount Sinai, you see University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, you see New York Presbyterian, you see all of, you know, and then if you're on the airplane, you see everybody advertising. Sure. They're, they're advertising, but advertisements are deceiving. It's the question of the, the people. I mean, I know you brought in that uh, top-notch uro urologist mm -hmm. over there, the minimally invasive guy, and you brought in some other people. How, you know, how do you make a hospital great today in, in, in this difficult environment without this profitability? This is a very important question because you don't make a hospital great by advertising. I mean, if you don't have a great product, people know it very quickly. Um, and making a hospital great means you have to make it great to a lot of different constituencies. You have to make it great to the doctors who practice there. You have to make it great to the families who stay there. And you have to make it great to the, f to the patients who are in the beds. And everybody requires something different. Um, in Mount Sinai's case, the first thing we needed to do for the hospital, for, I'm sorry, for the doctors, was to make surgery great in its support services. We had to make the ORs run perfectly, or as perfectly as we could, and we had to make everything when a, for a patient in the ORs to run great. For the families, it meant we had to really make service first. Um, we had to think about everything that could make their life more comfortable. And for the patients, you know, we had to realize that um, they were, patients had choices. And if they don't come away feeling that this is an exceptional experience, they won't recommend the hospital. It's because everybody comes after choosing their doctor, generally with the expectation that you're going to be very good, if not excellent. Um, if you're anything less than that, you disappoint patients. And to exceed those expectations is very hard. But we had to do it, and we had to spend money to do it. And that was a risk that we took, but, you know, it succeeded. So, but part of that then goes to the next step of building a larger campus. And, you know, First of all, everything in Manhattan is land constrained anyway, and you're constrained over there. I mean, in 97, mm -hmm. they built the Icon building, but now you, you take a garage or something, right? And what was the latest thing you did, this 170,000 right. square foot? We had an Emory Roth garage built in 27, <clears throat> um, and uh, we needed the space to grow programs. We were able to lease parking spots within five blocks of the campus, and uh, bring a shuttle bus to accommodate our employees um, and just renovate the whole building. So just two weeks ago, we officially opened the Center for Advanced Medicine, which is a both mixed hospital and medical school building that does um, community medicine, uh, rehabilitation medicine, ophthalmology, and uh, a lot of our primary care and specialty clinics. So basically, this was a parking lot that, that you've totally renovated, totally renovated. into a uh, medical center, uh, right. internal. And now the next project, which is this 490,000 right. square foot. We're going to build what we call the Center for Science and Medicine. It's a place that will focus on what we call translational medicine. But let me speak of what translational medicine is. Um, Mount Sinai, to step back, is a hospital that gave birth to a medical school that's always had a very tight connection between hospital and medical school. It's always been populated by doctors who've asked questions like, what's a new drug I could use? What's the best new therapeutic? Or what's really going on with this patient? And even 150 years ago, uh, they would have their laboratory in the hospital doing the kind of experiments that they thought were relevant to the patient. We call it going from bed to bedside, from laboratory 
to the bedside. Today, it's called translational medicine. And what it means is looking, learning in the laboratory, applying it to the patient in the bed, or learning from the patient in the bed and going taking it back to the laboratory. We think we can do that very well. We've always done it very well. But to do it today and really take advantage of the revolution in biology requires complex, multidisciplinary laboratories. So that people who are interested in a question like, why, what's the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease? They don't need just psychiatrists or neurologists. They need neuroscientists, geneticists, protein biologists, um, and a host of other people, all working together, addressing the question of how do you develop, what do you find a new target, how do you develop a drug for that target, and will it be safe? So within this facility, which will be part of it, another complex also, the lower level for the imaging will be below ground, right. correct? So we have imaging below ground so we can take a look at what's going on in patients, you know, in a very selective way, high resolution. And then we have clinical places where we do experimental therapeutics, so we see patients. Then we have laboratories. And we're going to focus in that building on brain diseases, and on cancer. And we're going to use imaging, and we're going to use uh, molecular biology, and we're going to use stem cell biology, um, to, and epidemiology to help us direct us and to design new so drugs. So when do you think this will be ready? Probably about three years. Three years. And what happens, where, where, do, you, where do you go next, I mean, after for building-wise? We are going to have to do something around ambulatory surgery because um, it's a growing area and uh, we need more space for it and patients does it demand for their ambulatory care a different setting than they do on an inpatient basis. Our faculty practice keeps growing so we're going to have to find places for more doctors offices and our infrastructure to support it requires more and more space. With only 45 seconds I would be neglectful if I didn't mention you have a wife who's a physician who's really an entrepreneur who's My wife is a very successful physician scientist who I had the good fortune to meet when I was in seventh grade and we began to date in medical school and she's been um, enormously successful in some of the uh, drugs that she has licensed to big pharma and her company continues to develop drugs for lots of interesting indications. And you have two children. Two children, Daniel and Jordana, who were wonderful kids and very successful. So, you know, for a person who grew up in Brooklyn, who really had your roots, you know, at Sinai as a medical student, you've gone full circle. And um, it's been great because you've been a, a great physician, researcher, and scientist, and now truly a builder in New York. Thank you for being here today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, SJP Properties, Allied Partners, Greenberg Traurig LP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust, Antares Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, CB Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Herrick Feinstein, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, John Katsimatidis, Herbert J. Sims Company, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Sidney Fetner Associates, Sheldrake Organization, Signature Bank, Studley, the Moynian Organization, Triangle Services, the Wickoff Organization, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction.